Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And, and of course, this verse is found several times in both of these chapters here, chapter 3 and chapter 4. <coughs> we see it in chapter 3 and verse 7. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost says, Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart. Verse 15 says, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. Chapter 4 and verse 7, today, if you'll hear his voice, <coughs> harden not your heart. And there's a lot of folks that, you know, they, they, they would say, well, certainly if I ever heard, you know, God's voice, <coughs> I'd, I, I'd never harden my heart and say, absolutely not. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. But to hear God's voice uh, is simply... Biblically, scripturally, theologically, we come to the conclusion that hearing God's voice is hearing His Word. Hearing His Word, it's hearing what He says, regardless of who that is that's repeating it to me. Now maybe you can remember back to when you were a kid. Maybe you still are. Maybe you had kids. And they came and said, Mom said. <laughs> Sometimes it wasn't always accurate, was it? Yeah. Sometimes it was a little bit skewed to their own advantage when they said, well, Mom said. But when someone says, God said. Acts 17 and verse 11 tells us this. It says, these were more noble. This is talking about the believers in a community called Berea. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind. That means they were ready to receive. You didn't have to warm them up. Didn't have to talk them into it. Didn't have to rationalize and reason and bring them to a conclusion. They, they, they were already ready. I'm going to share just a little bit about that. Um, I don't know where my, my, my phone went, but there's going to be some things on there that, uh, that I need. I think it's in the outside pocket of my bag there. That, that's mine? What are you doing with my phone? Did I give you yours? No? Give her her phone, will you? She don't like being without her phone. I like her to be comfortable in church. She's on the front row. <clears throat> These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. We're going to talk about a, a, a popular, quite popular, actually, practice among Christians in our day of logically and rationally arguing with unbelievers to prove that we're right. And we're never told to do that in the scriptures. No one should have to argue with anyone to prove the Bible right. The Bible is right. The Bible is right. These people didn't have to have the apostle prove every point of the scriptures to them. They received the word with all readiness of mind. Person's heart is right. They want the truth. They want to hear the truth. They want to hear God's voice. And there's no talking, talking me into it. it. It says they received the word with all readiness of mind. And, and what did they do then? And they searched the scriptures themselves to see that those things were so. To see that those things were so. So that's your part. That's your part. Accept and receive readily the scriptures, but then... Make sure that's what they really say. Amen. Make sure that's what they really say. Any of you ever heard someone say, well, the Bible says, but that's not really what the Bible said? Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you know, the scriptures teach, but that's not really what the scriptures teach. We're going to move along in 1 Timothy chapter 4 tonight, and we're going to discover that the apostle addresses that, and he addresses it more than once to these ministers, Timothy and Titus, and he's going to share with them about arguing with people, reasoning with people, proving that you are right. I, I've never had any problem whatsoever locating people that want to argue. <laughs> locating people that want to contend. I, I, I'm just never, I don't know, maybe you have, but I think it's pretty common that people want to argue. I really, I'm not going to preach on this, and this is not my, my subject matter, but I don't think our nation would be in the position and place that it is, politically especially, if that wasn't the case. As Christians, not one single solitary time are we told to argue and prove that we're right. We're told to proclaim the good news. And if they receive it, so be it, and if they don't, so be it. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and proclaim the good news. Preach the gospel to everyone everywhere. And they that believe and are baptized will be saved. They that don't, won't. They'll remain condemned. They'll remain condemned. So, so that's part of, what, part of what we're going to get to. I, I, I'm, 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 every time I read it, I'm just captivated by this seventh verse in 1 Timothy 4 but refuse profane and old wives' tales. Exercise yourself rather to godliness. You often wondered where that term came from, didn't you? You didn't know that was a Bible phrase. Old wives' tales. But it is. But it is. Made up stories and myths. Made up stories and myths. The original language doesn't even say wives implying married women. It just says that old women sitting around, talking and gossiping, conjure up, and then peddle as truth. Old wives' tales. And he's got to warn the minister again and again and again against profanity-laced arguments and old women's fables. Welcome to Living Word Christian Church. On a midweek service on a Wednesday night, I sure hope you're ready for tonight's message. So he starts off here in chapter 4 and says, now the Spirit speaks expressly. We shared that last week. Very evidently, very openly. You'll have no problem understanding that very expressly the Spirit speaks that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Some will depart from the faith. Uh, how many of you have ever flown on an airplane? All right, you, you flew somewhere, and then, and then you flew back. Well, obviously, you're here. Okay, where'd you fly back from? Las Vegas. Where'd you fly back from? Orlando. Where'd you fly back from? Florida. All right. Uh, so, Orlando and Florida. We don't know where in Florida, but we flew back from Florida. And in, in, in Las Vegas, uh, where'd, you, where'd you fly back from? LA. Los Angeles. Anybody else? Where'd you fly back from? Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs. One more. Where'd you fly back from? St. Thomas. St. Thomas. The Virgin Islands. Well, man. <laughs> Why'd you fly back? <laughs> so in each, in, each one of these, in each one of these individuals from LA, Colorado Springs, St. Thomas, Las Vegas, Florida, Orlando, Florida, there was a ticket printed out. And on that ticket and on the board all over the airport, there are always two columns on those boards, departures and arrivals. And you departed from L.A. You departed from Colorado Springs. You departed from St. Thomas. You departed from Las Vegas. You departed from Orlando. You departed from Florida. And, and, and you came back here. Now, if you'd never been to St. Thomas, you could never have departed from it. 
If you've never been in L.A. or Colorado Springs or Orlando, then you never could have departed from it. If you hadn't been to Las Vegas, if you hadn't been to the state of Florida, you couldn't depart from there. This indicates to us that in the latter times, there will be some who depart from the faith. That means they were there to begin with. That means at one time they were in the faith and they departed from it. It does not say they were swept out of it. It doesn't say that somehow they just found themselves no longer in St. Thomas. You have to get on a plane. You have to make your mind up to depart. And it says here that these individuals departed from the faith. You have to be somewhere to begin with before you can ever depart from it. And it says that's going to happen in the latter times. Now, we mentioned last week that over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. So one speaks of the latter times, and another speaks of the last days. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, it speaks of in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. So in one you have the latter times, which is a, a greater expanse of time than the last days. Times indicates periods of time, seasons. When the Bible talks in Daniel about times, times, and half a times, and, and it's talking about years. A time is a year. Another place when it talked about Nebuchadnezzar being out in the field for, for, for a certain number of times, they were seasons, about three-month periods. He spent seven of them out in the wilderness crawling around like an ox. We don't know what the, what the actual connotation being presented to us is. All that we know is that it says, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. I'm comforted by the fact that it doesn't say many. It yeah. doesn't say many shall depart from the faith. It just says some shall depart from the faith. Make your mind up tonight, if you haven't up to this point, one of those will not be me. Yeah. Now, we'll talk about how, how these actually are swayed to depart from the faith. Now, what kind of things cause people to depart from the faith? Disappointment. God hasn't been good enough. Something didn't work out the way they thought it should. A prayer didn't get answered. I believed God and I didn't get what I want. That causes a lot of people to depart from the faith. Disillusionment and disappointment. Some just let their love grow cold. Some, they grow lukewarm. They allow themselves to cool off. Some, they get swept up in the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things, and it chokes out the word. And it produces no fruit. Some people, it's affliction and persecution, being persecuted. Many, many different things cause people to depart from the faith, and some of them are going to be identified there. But let's look first at 2 Timothy chapter 3, when it says perilous times shall come. It doesn't say many shall depart from the faith. It just says in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be, what's the first one he lists here? Lovers. Well, well that's a good thing, isn't it? walk in love, we love the Lord, we love his people, we love his mission, we love his name, we love his house. That's not what it says, it says men should be lovers of their own selves. First thing mentioned, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. Think about that, that's the, that's the list, unthankful. Unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. That's called religion. Religion is a form of godliness, no power. No power, no power to change anything, no power to, no power to see uh, the miraculous of God manifest, no power. 
having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Actually, not, not just not having the power, denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse laws, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They shall proceed no farther. Their folly shall be manifest to all as theirs also was. And that's talking about the last days, some of the things that you'll see in the last days. When we get over to 2 Timothy, we'll tear that apart. We'll take it apart word by word and verse by verse and talk about the list of things that the Bible indicates will be seen in the last days. There's not one of them we don't see. There's not one of them. But here in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, it says in the latter times. I don't know if that's decades, in the latter decades, in the latter generations. It could be the latter centuries. It could be. Uh, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not going to stand and say, well, I can tell you this is what it means. I, I, I can't. I just know that it says in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. They were once in the faith. They were once in the faith, but they, they depart from the faith, giving heed to, and it mentions two things here. The reason that they will depart from the faith is two things. They'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Spirits, evil spirits, demons that, that seduce people. Not to necessarily commit a, a, a sin or even just do something wrong. That's not what seducing spirits do. They're seducing you to draw you out of the faith. Draw you away from the faith. And doctrines of devils, demonically inspired teachings and doctrines that cause people to depart from the faith. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, we, we, we pointed out that, that, that these demonic doctrines uh, and these seducing spirits have no physical voice. They, they, they don't have an English voice. They don't come up and plop down and start talking to you. That, that takes a human. That takes a human being to do that. That takes, that takes a vessel to, uh, to do that. It's a speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving from them that believe and know the truth. So he gives us two examples there. Those examples, of course, have been uh, applicable and relevant to every generation, not just that generation and not just our generation, but those two examples are examples that would have to be universal then for all of the human race. And so the two demonically inspired doctrines that the apostle points out in this verse that will go out to generations from the year the first century A.D., all the way up to right now, we're in the 21st century A.D., and he warns against these demonic doctrines and, and these seductions that draw people away. And, and what are the first two he mentions there? They will prohibit marriage, and they will require abstinent, abstinence from certain foods, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. Forbidding to marry and abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them and believe, that believe and know the truth. And so, so we'll, we'll cover these two just very, very briefly because this doesn't apply to everyone. We could have a raise of hands. We don't have to. How many people are married? How many people aren't married? How many people want to be married? How many people don't want to be married? How many? And, 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 and it's applicable here whether you are or whether you aren't, whether you want to be or whether you don't, the Bible says, I'll just give you one verse. I, we could go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and, and there's a whole chapter there, a whole chapter there that talks about divorced people, single people, widows and widowers, uh, young people, uh, people that people, well, they shouldn't get married. Well, I, I, what business is it of yours? Well, I just don't think they should get married, Pastor. Well, why not? Because they're too old. <laughs> uh, 
I've never had a problem with old people getting married. Most of the time remarried. I've never had a problem at all with people in their 80s or in their 90s. Pastor, what do you think about me getting married? Well, I can tell you're thinking about it if you're asking me. So I can only just tell you what the Bible says. Marriage is honorable in all. That's just what it says. Marriage is honorable in all. And, and you know, people, people in their 80s, some of our ministry friends in their 70s, and, and, and they just want to, get, they want to get married. Well, I don't know what business is it of anybody else, excuse me, to stick their nose in where it don't belong and give their opinion. Nobody asked for your opinion. You know, you don't have to have an opinion about everything. Did you know that? And even if you do, you don't have to share it with anybody. You can have an opinion. I have an opinion about a lot of things. Nobody knows what, uh, what they are at all. I just have an opinion about it. Well, I don't think they should get married. I don't even bite anymore. I don't even say why. I just... Because the Bible says refuse that. Don't get, don't get drawn into that. Well, I don't think they get married. They're too old. Now, what's the other one? They're too young. They're too young. Thank you. I don't think they should get married because they're too young. Well, the state says they can. <laughs> and that's the one issuing the marriage license. Well, you should tell them no. Oh, oh yeah, I've had them. Both old and young. Uh, varying spiritual backgrounds. Now, I'm not talking about one not born again and one is born again. But listen, that's not even my responsibility. And people come and say, well, I know he's not saved, but I think he will be uh, if I marry him. Well, then, Pastor, you shouldn't marry him because the Bible says, give me the Bible. Because the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked together. That's exactly what it says. Don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. I'm not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. They asked me to perform a ceremony. People, people forever have, have looked at the preacher as if you marry someone, you're endorsing that relationship. You're not endorsing anything. You're performing a ceremony of the church. You're performing a, one of the programs, one of the functions, one of the practices, actually, is the best word for it. You're performing one of the practices of the church. You're not putting yourself in agreement. I can tell this is revelation. <laughs> it's, it's not my business. I don't have to endorse anything. I don't have to, you know, they don't do that with funerals. <laughs> Oh, but listen real carefully. Listen real carefully. You may not think so, but I've been criticized for performing funerals. I don't care why they died. I don't care what condition they were in. They're dead. You're not going to perform a funeral and minister to family and friends and acquaintances and neighbors that you're going to have an opportunity to preach the gospel to because they lived a lifestyle that you don't agree with. They died intoxicated at the, at the wheel of an automobile. You know, that I didn't endorse the way they lived. I don't endorse the way they died. Just performing a service. Excuse me. Cut me some slack. <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I, don't need, I don't need anybody's mercy. There's nothing in the Bible that says the preacher has to endorse anything. Anything. But people, but people have no issue whatsoever criticizing the preacher, criticizing the pastor, criticizing the minister because they don't think they should have got married. Well, if they ask me, do you think we should get married? What am I going to say? Tell me what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, yes, I think you should. Or I'm going to say, no, I don't think you should. And they're going to get married anyway. I'll tell them the truth if they ask. But they just come and they just, 100% of the time with funerals. But with weddings, I mean, it's just, it, it's not a request. I mean, do you think, it's just an announcement. We're going to get married. Will you counsel us? Sure. Will you marry us? Sure. I, I don't have to endorse it. 
But for me to tell a couple, well, you're 94 and she's 98, and I don't think that you should get married. What, what, what's, what does it matter what I think? Even more important, <laughs> what's it matter what you think? It's not up to me to say, no, you're too old, I'm not going to marry. How about this one? How about this one? He's, you know, he's like ancient, like a dinosaur. You know, and she's, and she's about 19. Huh? Don't look so like, look like. You know, he's 108 and she's 19. And then they say, Pastor, you're not going to marry them, are you? They asked me to. I don't have to agree with what they're doing. I don't have to endorse what they're doing. I'll be honest with me, with them, if, if, if they ask. But it, it, there's nowhere in the Bible that it says, Preacher, you must endorse. You must believe. You must be persuaded. You, I don't have to live with them. <laughs> Let me clarify it. I'm responsible for one marriage. This one. And you aren't. Nobody else is. And, and as I look around at, at, at couples right here, you're responsible for your marriage. I'm not. Listen to these instructions. Just sit back and enjoy yourself. Yeah. You're welcome. Here we go. Here we go. Hearken to me. This is the priest talking. Hearken to me and I will counsel thee and God will be with thee. The priest is talking to the leader of God's people, Moses. Hearken to me and I will counsel thee and God will be with thee. Be for the people Godward that you may bring their causes to God and teach them ordinances and laws and show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. That would be Exodus chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Teach them ordinances and laws and show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. That's, that, that, that's, that's a great, great, great definition of the minister's responsibility. Teach people the way that they must walk and the work that they must do. That, that, that's the responsibility of the, of the preacher and of the minister. Not endorse what they do, who they are, how they act, how they live, or let them endorse the pastor and his marriage. Which brings us to a vital point. <clears throat> Can pastors marry? Well, let's see. The Bible says here that there'll be doctrines of demons in the last days that forbid marriage. I can't find one verse in the Bible that forbids marriage for any person desiring to serve the Lord in any capacity, male or female. Well, if you're going to serve in the church, if you're going to have a position, if you're going to be the preacher, if you're going to be the minister, we're going to forbid that you have the privilege of marrying. That's a doctrine of demons according to this scripture right here in the Bible. When I read my Bible, you were here on Sunday morning. When I read my Bible, we had our commissioning service here and we gave the qualifications of elders and deacons. Those would be officers in the church, leaders in the church. And I seem to remember that it said they must be the husband of one wife. Not that they must be celibate and never marry. So let me go back to just because there are two people in their 90s or hundreds, uh, just because there are two people in, still in their teens, just because there's one person in their hundreds and one in the other one in their teens. If I look at that and I say, no, you can't get married. If I do that, uh, I'm guilty of what this verse right here, declares it is a doctrine of demons. I may not agree with them. I, 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 for that matter, I may not agree with their ceremony. 
I may not agree with their reception. Very, very often I don't. I may not agree with what they serve there. I may not agree with their music. I may not agree with their dress, their colors, their bubbles. <laughs> so what? I said, so what? It's their ceremony, it's not mine. And it's their wedding, it's not mine. And it's their life, and it's not mine. So, so I, I hope I've only used myself as an example, but I hope that helps you and just sets you free and liberates you from thinking that you always have to, you know, pass judgment on whether or not you think a person should or shouldn't get married. Okay? Now, now, uh, and I've been open about this, been very open about it. My ordaining authority forbids me to marry two people of the same gender. Good sense forbids me from performing some weddings like I, I don't know why you'd want to marry a tree. I know it's a special tree. I know it's, oh yeah, you're looking at me like pastor, come on. The internet is wonderful for some things. I don't know why you'd want to marry your dog. I'm a dog guy. Oh yeah. Now it would never happen in Wisconsin, but it did in New York. I don't know why you'd, I mean, Fifi is really special, I'm sure. <laughs> But you're going to have to find another preacher. Yeah. We have a Bible pattern, Adam and Eve. have a Bible pattern, one man, one woman, and, and that's our Bible pattern. I don't know why you'd want to <laughs> marry a hologram. <laughs> oh, yeah, Japan. Yep, first hologram wedding <laughs> in the whole. <laughs> hologram. It's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's fake, it's right? I mean, it's just... It's a reflection. It's a, it's a computer-generated... Okay. I mean, I, I, I could go on, and we're just going to leave it there. We have a Bible pattern. Our God performed the first wedding. It was a pretty limited deal. There's... One man, he looked all around and all he saw was hippopotamuses, <laughs> elephants, zebras, gazelles, German short-haired pointers. And there was not found one suitable to be Adam's companion. So God made a woman, brought her to the man, and he said, this is it. That's what he said, this is it. And the Lord performed that wedding. And ever since then, ever since then, people have been linking up and, and, and being joined together. Uh, and I, I remember I performed one wedding and I remember this young lady, she came to me one week before the ceremony. They weren't church attenders, they weren't part of our church back when I did weddings uh, for people that weren't, I don't anymore. But at that time I did, and, and they came and they went through their three or four or five premarital counseling appointments. And the week before the wedding, so at some point, Tuesday, Wednesday, there's, she came and she said, I know I shouldn't marry him. I know I shouldn't. I know it's never gonna last. I know it's not gonna work. I said, then why are you? Why? I pled with that girl. I pleaded with her. She said, no, we already had the shower and, every, and everybody's already RSVP'd to the reception. I said, they'll understand. They'll understand. She said, no, I'm just gonna go through, hope for the best. And she did, and I performed the wedding. And less than nine months later, I read in the paper that they were divorced. 
Now for just an instant, I felt responsible. And then I got over it. And I stood up and said, no, why would I be responsible? They came to me and said, we won't get married. They came to me and said, will you counsel us? They came to me and said, will you perform the ceremony? She came to me and said, it's not gonna work. I pleaded with her, everything in me, to, to not go through with it, but the RSVPs were already in, so they did. And it just ended up in, in the one column in the statistics, which is higher than the other column. And that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to do everything I can to help them and show them the way that they must walk and the things that they must do. That they must do. If, if they don't, if they don't, then, then that's up to them. It's not up to me to say yes or no. It's not up to me to approve or forbid. You see that? It's a doctrine of demons to forbid to marry. You see it? Yeah. Prohibiting marriage. Again, Hebrews 13, 4 says marriage is honorable in all. Then it goes on and says, and require abstinence from certain foods. Well, it actually mentions meats right there. Commanding to abstain from meats or certain foods, which God has created to be received. So God created to be received, but we're going to forbid you to eat grapes for the next month. God created wheat, but we're going we're to forbid you and say you can't eat any wheat. Or, or let's take the example out of the verse. You can't eat meat. You can't eat meat. Now, may, let me make it absolutely crystal clear. If you choose not to eat meat or not to eat certain meat or not to eat certain foods, that's up to you. You can make that choice. Nobody should be able to force you, uh, unless, unless you're one year old, you know, you're going to eat these Gerber peas whether you want to or not. <laughs> you know, but, but, but all things being equal, nobody should force you uh, that you have to eat meats, you have to eat any kind of certain food. But if you make that choice, if you do that for health reasons, uh, I, I was in a ceremony earlier this morning here in La Crosse uh, with a, a very, very well-known and high-ranking member of our community, uh, and he's made the choice to, to uh, not eat meat, not eat dairy products, not eat sugar, those kind of things. That, that's his choice. He moved into our community and took that position in 2007. And, and so uh, for the past 15 years, uh, he's held to that. I don't find anything wrong with that ever unless, please say unless. unless, unless you think you're more spiritual because you do that. There's nothing more spiritual about I don't eat Snickers bars and I know you do. <laughs> Frankly, I don't eat Snickers bars. I eat Kit Kats. <laughs> If, 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 if you only want to eat, want, want some scripture, want some Bible? Yes. All right, let's, let's, let's look at it here, verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from each. These are doctrines of devils. That's what the Bible says. Which God created. Who? God, God created. To be received with thanksgiving. He created them to be received with thanksgiving. Not on thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. <laughs> of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused, if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. It's sanctified, it's set apart for a holy purpose and a holy use, if it's received with a word of God. And literally what this says is a word of God offered in prayer. All right, let's go back to Romans chapter 14. 14th chapter of Romans. This is such a great chapter. This is one of those heart checkup chapters for everyone. It talks about not being critical of other people. Not being critical of other people. All right. Wow, what enthusiasm about that. <laughs> About that truth, all right? Uh, Romans chapter 14, say, say, look at your neighbor and say, all the Bible's good. All the Bible's good. 
See, every scripture is inspired by God, given by inspiration of God, and is profitable. So these are all profitable. He that is weak in faith, receive, but not to doubtful disputations. One believes he may eat all things. Another who is weak eats only herbs. That's vegetables. Let not him that eats despise him that doesn't eat. And let not him that doesn't eat judge him that eats. For God has received him. See, just because you eat something that I don't eat, listen, I voluntarily abstain from sushi. <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't eat raw fish, that's all. We have a stove in our house. <laughs> Fry pans, oil, air fryer, microwave. We have many options. <laughs> Boiling pan. But if you want to eat it, I'm not going to hassle you about it. Just don't ask me, do you want to bite? I went, I went with some law enforcement professionals down in our state's capital one day, and they'd say, you want to go to lunch with us? I, sure, sure. And, and we went, and it was a sushi bar. They didn't tell me we were going to a bar, but it was just a sushi bar. You, you know what sushi is, right? Ro roll up just, just raw fish, and, and they said, oh, you have to try it. I said, no, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> well, they said, you're going to try it, aren't you? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm fasting today. <laughs> I called it, right? I called a fast right then. Right then. Now, it's got nothing to do with me being spiritual. Zero. Zilch. Nothing to do with me being spiritual. Nothing whatsoever. It's a taste factor. I, I, I don't, I, there's nothing appealing about raw fish to me. Nothing. Fried fish, poached fish, boiled fish, broiled fish. Bring it. Bring it all. Extra tartar sauce with it. But, but, but just not raw fish. But, but, but it, it, it goes the same, absolutely the same with pork. You're no more spiritual than other people because you don't eat ham. There's nothing spiritual about what you eat or what you don't eat. Thank you for your enthusiasm again. <laughs> we'll see it in the scripture. So he says one here, we'd call them a vegetarian or a vegan. Nothing wrong with that. Don't look down your nose at it. Just eat your Big Mac. And I'm getting shouting and hanky waving <laughs> over <laughs> over whoppers, <laughs> bratwurst. Yeah. Let me hear it. Come on. Yeah. Let not him that eats despise him that eats not, and let not him that eats not look down his nose at the person that eats. Don't judge each other over this stuff. Verse four: Who are you to judge another man's servant? And he's talking about what you eat. And what you don't eat. Coffee. I, I don't know why that word came to me right there. <laughs> Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Yea, and he will be held up, for God is able to make him stand. Then he talks about regarding days, uh, and, and he talks about every one of us will give an account. Verse 12. So many Christians would do themselves so much good if they would memorize verse 12, and then go past memorizing it and just do it. Romans 14, verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You won't give an account for anybody else. You just give an account for you. You just give an account for you. All right, verse, verse 14. Look at verse 14. It says, I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. That's a pretty powerful verse, don't you agree? Yes, nothing. Thing. N O T H I N G. There is nothing. Nothing. You want to eat those coffee grounds after you drink that water that you strained through it? Go right ahead. Nothing unclean of itself. Now, he's not just talking about food there because he also talked about practices. He talked about observations and celebrations and things like this. I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus, there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems the thing to be unclean, to him it's unclean. To him it's unclean. I walk by oysters and I say, unclean. <laughs> now, maybe you like oysters. That's completely up to you. I don't care. Slurp away. <laughs> To him that esteems anything to be unclean, then it's unclean. Skip down and look at verse 20, and it says, Meat destroys not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, 
but it's evil for that man who eats with offense. It's good neither to eat flesh or drink wine or any other thing whereby your brother stumbles or is offended or is weak. Now, 1 Corinthians, you're going to talk about that a little more. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And see, these verses talk about take, take, take others into consideration. Take others into consideration. Now see, now this doesn't happen a lot in the U.S. There's a lot more Bible truth. There's a lot more Bible enlightenment. But when you go on to the mission field, you, you ought to take these things into consideration because you go on the mission field because of their culture. And you'll be in some big restaurant. They'll, they'll bring an appetizer and they'll set that appetizer down. And every one of them will go, <gasps> and they'll watch you. You eat one of those, you are a heathen. You even touch it. Now, now, you have to minister at their church. You have to teach at their Bible school. You have to, you're better off just to look around and say, well, this is going to be offensive to them. I don't have to eat it. You don't have to prove your point. Bless God, I don't care what the rest of you do. You don't have to, you don't have to prove anything. Yeah, you just push it away. Say, it's okay. I didn't like to thought of eating pig's eyeballs anyway. They have things in their societies that prohibit them and they consider it something spiritual. Well, the Bible says don't use your liberty to cause another brother to stumble. Yeah, just leave it be. All right, did you, did you find it with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 23. What are the first two words of 23? I don't know how you interpret all and things, but I'm pretty simple. I just read what it says, all things. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let not everyone seek his own, but everyone another's good or another's wealth. <clears throat> then he gets into this section on eating again. Whatever is sold in the meat market, that's what the shambles means if you have a King James Bible. Whatever is sold, any of you ever been in an outdoor meat market? I don't mean outside the store down here at the food co-op. I mean where you got to wave the flies away and you can't tell what color meat it is because there's so much dust on it and, and, and you can't even describe the smell of that place. And you got people dickering over, do we want to buy the cow's head or the two goat's heads? I mean the head. And, 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 and <clears throat> they're not kidding when they say they, they sell every part of the pig except the squeal. Well, that's what he's dealing with here. No refrigeration. No big Tyson food semis driving up and down the interstates. This is the meat market where they kill stuff. Oh, watch where you step. Oh, we've been in some of those, haven't we, Paula? Oh, nauseating. Oh, we're going to buy dinner. Please don't. <laughs> <coughs> but that's what they have. So whatever sold in the shambles, the meat market, eat it. Asking no question for conscience sake. You know, you know they put it in front of you. This, this is what the Bible says, that, that when you're at somebody's house and they put it in front of you, just eat it. Don't ask what it is. I mean, sometimes you've got to live by faith. <laughs> you don't even know what it is. Whatever sold in the meat market, eat. Asking no question. Now, he's not talking here in these sections of Scripture. He's not talking about sanitary conditions. He is not referencing flies and dirt and dust. He's referencing that this meat most likely has been offered in sacrifice to an idol. And part of their worship Part of their worship in idol worship is to take that animal, slay it, let its blood drain out in front of this idol, then eat and consume the meat off of that animal. That's all part of idol worship. Idol worship is not just bowing down and chanting in front of some piece of stone or ivory or wood. This is part of idol worship. And then they sell it in the meat market. 
what part they don't eat, they, they sell in the meat market. Might as well make some money off it. And he says, whatever sold, eat it. Eat it. Verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If anyone that believes not invites you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatever set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man says to you, this was offered in sacrifice to idols, then don't eat it. For the sake of the one that pointed that out to you, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not yours, but the other one. But then why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? For that for which I give thanks, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, giving no offense, neither the Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. Now, we won't preach on this hardly, just a little bit maybe. But underline that verse, highlight that verse, put brackets around that verse, dog ear the page of your Bible right there at that verse, circle it, put arrows to it, Make blinking lights all around it. Do something to verse 32. It is a exceptionally, extremely important theological verse in the Bible. The fact that the entire world's population, the entirety of the world is broken down into three groups of people. Everybody in the world, Jews, everyone who's not a Jew, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only of the three that are guaranteed a seat at the table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Such a great controversy. It doesn't have to be, it's not controversial at all. There's not one place in the whole Bible that says, because you are a Jew, you're in heaven. Jews are the ones that the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10 says, my heart, my heart aches for my own people. My heart's desire for my own people, the Jewish people, is that they get saved. And I don't know where the doctrine comes from, but it's still prevalent today. That, that, well, they're God's chosen people, so they somehow get a pass. There's no pass. There's no pass. There's one way to heaven. He came and preached to them, and they rejected him. Now, this is a long time between then and now, and praise God, anybody can be saved. Anybody can be saved. We know a number of, of, of great Jewish believers, previous Jews. If you're a Gentile, you were just previous sinner. But, but Jews need to be saved, Gentiles need to be saved, and once you're saved, you become part of the church. And that's the entirety of the human race right there in one verse. Jews, Gentiles, or the church. Even as I please all men and all things, I told you we weren't going to preach much on it. I'm off that now. Making of my own prophet, but the prophet of many, that they may be saved. Uh, let's see. Turn back to Mark chapter 7. Mark, Gospel of Mark, 7th chapter. Hope I'm not boring you tonight. <laughs> We're talking about eating. You don't mind eating, do you? This is a requirement in this life. Might as well enjoy it. You don't have to. All right, Mark chapter 7, are you there? All right, so these folks... These folks made doing the dishes a religious obligation. Yeah, they did. Doing the dishes. We just let the dogs lick those plates off and... I don't know, looking at some of your faces, I was joking, I think you might be serious about that. <laughs> My turn to do dishes tonight? Come here, George. Here's it. <laughs> What'd you use to feed your dog? Liver. Liver. 
I don't blame you at all. <laughs> and that old dog, and Paul would tell me those kids, they, they'd cut chunks of liver off. and Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mom, what's that over there? And they'd hold it down there, and, and that dog would be going at it. And, they, and they'd raise their voice and talk real loud to Mom like this. So Mom wouldn't hear, come, 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 come. <laughs> right? <laughs> All that liver's going off my plate. You want some more? No, I'm full. <laughs> well, they, they, uh, they, they, they made a religious... See, you, you, you can be religious about anything. Yeah. You, you can take any practice that there is and make it religious. And that means you'll be more spiritual if you do it. You'll be more spiritual. And people that are less spiritual don't. And, and they did that with washing their hands. They did that with washing their hands. See, they, they, saw, they saw some of his disciples eating bread with unwashed hands. <gasps> They're eating it. You don't have to. Yeah, they're, they're, you didn't wash your hands first. Now, that may be good hygiene. My grandma would approve. She's the first one I remember teaching, you are not going to eat till you wash your hands. And if the soap's not wet, you're not done yet. And then you're going to dry them on a clean towel. My pants would always work just fine. Why dirty a towel? <laughs> So, verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off and they will not eat, holding to the tradition of the elders. What about holding to the Word of God? Why not just do what the Word of God says about washing your hands before you eat? Nothing. But see, they, they come up with these traditions and add them in, and pretty soon they're just as important as the Bible. And then after not too long, they are even more important than what the Bible says. Verse 4, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they don't eat. And many other things which they have received, they hold to. Washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and tables. And the Pharisees said, why don't the disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders? And they eat bread with unwashed hands. And Jesus answered and said, well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites? As he wrote, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. You've laid aside the commandments of God, and you hold the traditions of men, like washing pots and cups and many other such things, do you? Full well you reject the word of God. Reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own traditions. Verse 13 says, you make the word of God you make the word of God of no effect by your traditions which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Look at verse 14. He called all the people and he said, listen to me, every one of you, and understand. There's nothing from the outside that enters into a man that can defile him. I've ate some things I was sure defiled me. I could tell by the rumble. I could tell because I was trying to catch my breath. But he's talking from a spiritual sense right there. Spiritual. Nothing from the outside that enters into a man can defile him. The things which come out of him, those are what defile a man. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house of people, his disciples concerning the parable asked him, and he said, Are you without understanding too? Do you not perceive that whatever thing from the outside that enters into a man cannot defile him or make him unclean? Because it enters not into his heart, but into his belly and goes out with the cleansing which purges all meat. He says, that which comes from the outside of a man, that, excuse me, that which comes out of a man, that's what defiles a man. So we've got scripture after scripture. Turn back, if you would, with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, that Jesus taught, Paul taught there uh, in Romans. He taught again in 1 Corinthians that it's not about what you eat. And it's not about what you drink. It's not about what you chew on. It's not, that, that's, that's not going to defile you. 
okay? Uh, it may have some effect on your complexion. It may have some effect on your circulation. It may have some effect on your overall health. It may have some effect on your breath. It may have some, some, some effect on you that either you or, or, or others aren't gonna uh, uh, appreciate, but it's not gonna make you less or more spiritual. And so when he looks at this as a doctrine of devils, he's dealing with this fact that because you abstain from marriage or because you tell people you forbid them to marry, then they're more spiritual. And, and, and a person remaining single uh, and in choosing not to marry feels like they're more spiritual. No, it's not a spiritual decision. It's not a spiritual determination. And you can't take any group of people that serve in the kingdom of God and say, well, because you're in that position, well, you can do it, but it's not a doctrine of the Lord. It's a tradition of man. And the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. Likewise, the same way, to abstain from meat, I apologize if I should have done this back during Lent. But it will come again. You're no more spiritual because you don't eat any particular food than you are if you do eat that particular food. No more spiritual at all. There, there was these two preachers. Remember these? Remember these guys? These, these two preachers. Um, <clears throat> actually, um, no, there was only one of them that was a preacher. The other was a member coming to his, to his uh, uh, faith group. And, and the preacher... The preacher uh, said, well, you can come to our faith group, but you have to renounce all of your former beliefs and you have to conform to our religion. He said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, that means you can't eat meat anymore. You have to give up eating meat. And, and he said, well, that would be very difficult for me, but if that's all I have to do, well, he says, there's one more thing. He said, you have to stand here, and I'm going to wave my hand over you three times. And I'm going to say, and I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll skip the titles. Uh, I'll just say, uh, you, used to be a, you used to be a Baptist, and he waved his hand. You were born a Baptist, and he waved his hand again and said, you were raised a Baptist. But he said, now you're a Pentecostal. He said, that's all it takes? He said, that's all it takes. So he, that's how he became one. Well, the next Friday night, the preacher was invited over to his house for dinner. And he had two giant porterhouse steaks right on the grill. And he walked in, he looked at it and said, what are you doing? You're part of us now. You can't eat steak. You can't eat meat. Oh, he said, it's okay. I waved my hand over and said, you were born a, a steak and, and you lived a steak, but now you're fish. You're no more spiritual because you eat fish and other people eat steak. No more spiritual whatsoever. If you want to do it, I mean, I kind of like it because they have fish fries everywhere. And I love fish. I mean, don't, don't take the fish fries away, whatever you do out there. Just, especially the all-you-can-eat ones. Batter fried cod. Those waiters and waitresses. What do you have? I'll have the all-you-can-eat fish special. Would you like it Baked or batter fried? Listen, if I'm going to eat all you can eat, I want the batter too. I know it's not good for me, but if I'm going that far, I might as well go all the way. <laughs> Paula doesn't eat fish. She don't like fish. She doesn't like fish. I can't remember her eating fish twice in her life. She just doesn't like it. Doesn't like crawdads either. Right? We'll have fish. I don't talk about our business much. It's none of your business, but uh, you know what? We'll have fish. And I mean, I catch them. She helps me catch them. I mean, she waxed me last week. We went fishing and she gave me a lesson or two or three. She did really good. She'll help me clean them. 
She puts the worms on her own hooks. I said, you'd make your grandpa proud. He took her fishing when she was a little girl. And, and all those fish, all of those fish, she doesn't eat any of them. And she'll fry them. She fries the best fish fry. Nobody holds a candle to the fish that she makes. She ought to get her recipe. She ought to do it at one of your women's meetings. It's outstanding. And I eat fish. And she'll make a whole pan of cheesy potatoes. <laughs> Beans, some fresh crescent rolls. You ever heard that song? I'm in heaven. <laughs> you know what she eats? And she sings this little jingle every time she does. Every time. I eat fish and, and she eats a bologna sandwich. <laughs> I eat fish and she eats and she stands over there and she says, My bologna has a first name. <laughs> It's O-S-C-A-R. My blowney has a second name. It's M-E-Y-E-R. I live to eat, love to eat it every day. And if you ask me why, I'll say. Every time. Because Oscar Mayer has a way with B-O-L-O-G-N-A. <laughs> Welcome to Living Word Christian Church tonight. She doesn't do that because she's more spiritual. She does it because she likes baloney. I don't eat it because I'm more spiritual. <laughs> no, I don't like baloney. I don't like Oscar Mayer baloney. I like the jingle, but I don't like Oscar Mayer baloney. Squirt some mustard on that stuff so I don't have to taste it. <laughs> Liverwurst. <laughs> Think about the name of that stuff. <laughs> we all have our challenges with the Bible. <laughs> but why anybody would take a perfectly good, fresh piece of North Atlantic cod that would be great, boiled or broiled, and soak it in lye <laughs> for two weeks, and then when it becomes like jelly, they eat it and call it lutefisk. Oh, no. <laughs> Seriously. We're going to pray for deliverance as soon as the service is... Come to a conclusion, however, I'm going to close it. I always look at Ludifus. I think of my, my first manager when, when we moved to La Crosse and we, uh, we um, church was, you know, about, well, a number of our services, the people in the front row right here, four people, that'd be the whole service. And some six and some 10. And, and uh, I, had a, I had a retail job at the same time, worked 45 to 50 hours a week. And... and Watch the Lord build our, our, our church. And the manager of that store, Merlin Unti, I don't know if he's still alive or not. I don't know if this had ever come to him, but I appreciate him. And, and he, was, he was a good man. And he came to me one day. He said, so you're a deer hunter? I said, yes, sir. You like to hunt them? I do. You kill them? Well, I find it hard to get them in the trunk if they're not dead, so yeah. <laughs> He said, you eat them? I said, yeah. He said, well, person gave me several packages of deer steaks one time. He said, and I found the secret to cooking venison so it was edible. I said, what is it? He said, well, first of all, you take your pan and you get it, you get it hot. You get it hot. And he said, then I butter the pan first butter all over the pan. I do that when I make omelets. It's a secret. Butter it real good. Then you put oil in there. You get that so hot, that oil is just popping and sparking and sparking. And then you take a whole onion and you chop that whole onion up and you put that in that pan. 
let them just get just browned a little bit. Then you take that deer steak and then you just put that venison steak right in there. Sear it on one side, put it on the other side. He said, here's the secret. Then you take a piece of a pine board, like a one by four, about five inches long, and you sit it right in the pan, right with the steak. Really? He said, yeah. Then you throw everything else out and eat the pine board. <laughs> That's what I think of when I think of Ludafisk every time I do. <clears throat> we better get back here. I'll never get this congregation back, Lord. I'm just... Religious people would say, I'm more religious because I don't eat certain things. Or you're less religious because you do eat certain things. And, and being spiritual is not based on what you eat. It's not based on, and, and that's a doctrine of demons. It's not about eating. It's about feeling more spiritual because you're unmarried. Feeling more spiritual because you don't eat a certain thing. Now, those are the only two that the Bible points out. Those are the only two that the Bible actually identifies. But it doesn't take much thinking to, well... Some of, our, some of our members came from cultures that emphasize that you're more spiritual if you wear certain colors. If you don't wear certain colors, you're more spiritual if you... Did, did you know that buttons are more spiritual than zippers? Right? See, it doesn't matter to me if you wear buttons or zippers, just tie something around yourself. Okay. But it's not more spiritual. Your spirituality is based on the Lord Jesus Christ and your acceptance of what he did for you and the righteousness that you have with God, your right standing with God that comes through that. Not who you are, not what you do, or not what you don't do. The righteousness of God is a gift. Right there in Romans chapter 5, look at it up here, chapter 5, verse 17. Right standing with God is a gift. For by one man's offense, death reigned, that was Adam, by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for you. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for you, that you might be the righteousness of God in him. See, it's what he did. It's not what you do. It's what he did. Religion wants you to get your eyes on you, and you do, and you don't do, and you keep the Ten Commandments, and you don't commit this, and you don't perform this, and you don't do this, and you do do this, and do this, and do this. Great, great guidelines for living life, but it doesn't make you any more spiritual. What places you in right standing with God is what Jesus did. 1 Peter 2.24 He bore your sins in his own body on the tree that you, being dead in your sins, could live righteous. Righteous. Romans 5 and verse 1 Therefore being justified by not eating certain things. Therefore being justified by not being in relationship with another human. Therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God. See, we're in right relationship with God. We're no longer the enemies of God. The 10th verse in that chapter said, when we were yet enemies, he died for us. We're no longer enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son, not by our doing or not doing anything or everything. It comes by what he did, not by what you do. And that's the focus of those particular verses and those particular scriptures. See him? See him? All right, let's, let's, we have time? We might have time. For every creature of God is what? Good. Say again. Good. Every creature of God is? Good. Come on, I'm waiting because I can, I can see that, uh, uh, is the hour getting to you? Every creature of God is good. Every creature of God is good. And nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Remember these verses? 
our Thanksgiving, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What a, what, a, what a powerful, what a great portion of Scripture. But 1.18 just jumps out, in everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if it's to be received, nothing's to be refused, if it's received with thanksgiving, Verse 5, for it is sanctified, that means purified, by the word of God and prayer. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does that look like? The best translation that I've ever found of this verse helps me understand it, helps many understand it, is for it. What is it? What God created? Food stuff, food substance. For it is sanctified by the word of God offered in prayer. It's the best translation I've ever found of that verse. It is sanctified by the word of God offered in prayer. Now, I'm not picking on my upbringing or those who, who performed it, but we always prayed a prayer when we sat around the table. It went like this. You want to do it with me? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let these gifts to us be blessed. What part of Scripture is that? What verse, what word of God did we just offer in prayer? None. We didn't. It wasn't there. Or, or how about, how about <clears throat> a little later in life, you know, you learned the headache prayer. You know, when you're on your, all around your, your buds and teammates and stuff, you know, you go like this, <clears throat> like you're clearing your throat or something, and you always got to rub your forehead. We called it the headache prayer. <clears throat> Lord bless this mess. Amen. What, what, what word did you offer in prayer? See, I'm not picking on anybody's prayer. I'm picking on me. If I'm picking on anyone, the Bible says all of your food is to be received with thanksgiving, and it is sanctified by the word offered in prayer. It's sanctified by the word offered in prayer. So when you give thanks for your food, offer the Word of God as you pray. All right, so want to help me? Want to help me? We'll get done faster if you help me. What Bible verse can you offer when you pray over your meal? Raise your hand if you have one. What Bible verse can you offer Go ahead. Speak up. That's a Bible verse. Lord, your word says that all food is to be received if it's to be received with thanksgiving. That's, that's giving a word in prayer. Thank you for this food. We receive it gratefully. The Bible tells us to do everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good. A verse? Exodus 23, 25. It says, and if you will serve the Lord, he will bless your bread and your water. That means all you eat and all you drink. It goes on to say, he'll drive sickness from your midst, fulfill the number of your days, and in nothing will you be barren or unfruitful in all of the land. Lord, that's what your word says. Thank you for blessing our food today because we serve you. Now, if you don't, you can't claim that verse. But it says in Exodus 23, 25, that if you serve the Lord, he'll bless what you eat and bless what you drink. Lord, you said you'd bless it. Thank you that it's blessed. We receive it in thanks in Jesus' name. Good. Was there another one? Speak, speak really loud. Every good gift comes from God. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good thing and every perfect thing comes from God. And so I receive this food with thanks. I just gave the Lord a word, and I offered it in prayer. That means my food is sanctified. All right, let me give you a couple more. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 10 says that the Lord gives seed to the sower and bread for our eating. Thank you for providing this food. 
We accept and receive it with thanks. We thank you for it, and we give you your word that says you provide. All right, how about Philippians 4.19? Lord, your word says that you supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we receive this from your hand. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, how about Exodus chapter 16? Lord, your word says that you rained bread out of heaven. You provided manna for your people and quail. And quail. So pray this one when you're at Chick-fil-A. I mean, <laughs> chicken sandwiches. You provided bread and you provided quail. And, and thank you for providing this food for us. You can couple those scriptures together. You provided manna for them in the wilderness. You provide bread for our eating. Every good thing comes from you. We're grateful for it. According to Exodus 23, 25, we serve you. We receive this food with thanksgiving. All right, here's a couple more. Uh, Acts chapter 10 and verse 15. This is one of my favorites. This is where God said to Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Yeah. Acts chapter 10 and verse 15, the Lord's voice spoke to Peter and said, what God has cleansed, don't call unclean. What God has cleansed, don't call unclean. Hmm? And then that, that, was, that was all about food. How about Deuteronomy 28 and verse 5? How about Deuteronomy, Lord, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 28 and verse 5? It says, Blessed shall be your basket and your store. And the basket is what you have it in as you're eating out of it. Uh, and the store will be your refrigerator, your pantry, your freezer, your anything else where it's actually where it's actually stored. Lord, you said if we would diligently hearken to your voice and be doers of your word, then you would bless our food and where it's stored. Thank you for blessing it. We receive it from your hand. Uh, how about this one? How about Psalm 23 and verse 5? Uh, Psalm 23 and verse 5. I mean, you said in the presence of my enemies that you would prepare a banqueting feast. Prepare the table before me. Well, thank you for everything that's prepared on this table. And, uh, uh, and how about this one? And the hands that prepared it. Well, if that was a Bible verse, I, I, I guess we would pray it, but, uh, but it's not. It's not. And that's not the time to pray for the missionaries either. Okay. Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub. <laughs> or this great verse, if you forget to pray, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. <laughs> That'd be Psalm 103, verse 1. And, 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 and if you miss it a little bit, if you miss it a little bit, and then finally, my, 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 my final here, Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8, verse 9. Uh, and verse 12, Deuteronomy 8, verse 9, uh, and then verse 12, wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. You shall not lack anything. You shall not lack anything. So, Lord, thank you that we don't lack, and thank you that we eat now today, and there's abundance at our table, and we don't eat bread with scarceness. In verse 12, same chapter, and, and it says, and when you have eaten and are full. When you have eaten and are full. So those are just a few verses. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Word of God says, He will sanctify what you eat and drink. He'll bless what you eat and drink. But there's a specific way to do that. Number one, receive it with thanks. Number two, it's sanctified by a word offered in prayer. Incorporate a Bible verse into your meal prayers. Amen. Incorporate a Bible verse. Now, I said to you on Sunday uh, that I'd share, you know, something that most likely you hadn't ever, ever heard before. I probably already have tonight. I mean, we've ever been everywhere from Ludafisk to... <laughs> Where in the Bible does it say you're covered because someone else prays at your table? Tell me where. Everybody smiles and they, they, they take the three-year-old and they say, say grace, honey. Where's that in the Bible? That you're covered because someone else speaks the word of God 
and offers thanks at your table and you say amen. Where is that in the Bible? That's a tradition of man. And it has proliferated the entire body of Christ worldwide that we think because someone else prays and we nod or we respectfully are silent while they do, that we're covered. We don't have one single solitary Bible verse that ever even remotely indicates that that should be our practice. Now, you don't have to pray. You don't have to. But you can. Do you? I always do. I have to eat that. But it doesn't say in these verses because someone else speaks the word of God, because someone else says thank you, at least say thank you. Amen. That's a great question, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that, that, that's worth your whole admission price. <laughs> Just stop and think about it. Wow. Why do we do that? Because we've always done it. Because we've always done it. Because every one of us was raised that way. We're going to hold hands, we're going to bow our heads. Somebody, you know, grandpa, dad, the littlest. Little Missy Lou, you know. <clears throat> but the Bible talks to you and says, your food is sanctified, set apart, purified by offering the word of God in a prayer and being thankful. God bless you. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.